Um, not too social. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Have a touch, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. Go ahead, take out your notes. We're going to continue with our United States Constitution. You can do it in just a sec. With the uh, study of the United States Constitution. Is that what you usually write it on? Is there a solution? You could do it on your. You could do it on that. You could write it on a piece of paper here. I've got, I've got extra paper over there, so if you ever need like a piece of paper, you're so welcome. Do you have something to write with? Good, 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 good. Okay. So um, yes, there's no quiz today. We don't have a quiz for the uh, remitter. We're getting closer to the end of this unit, and we're going to be like wrapping it up here pretty soon. And then we'll give you an announcement of when the test is for this. Okay. So, shall we? All right, let's do this. United States Constitution, details, details, details on the executive branch. This is one thing I wanted to make sure that you had in your notes. Last time we talked about the president having the power to pardon. Michael, when can a president pardon? What are the circumstances that a president can pardon somebody? And perhaps, when can a president not pardon somebody? I'll ask it this way. If I haven't done anything wrong yet, can the president pardon me? Yeah. No. <laughs> it has to have been something that's happened already. OK? Vera. If I have done something potentially wrong in violation of state law, can a president pardon me? Good. What are the only uh, kinds of criminal legal violations that a president can pardon somebody for? One's controlled by, if it's not state or local government, it's what government? I'll give you a clue. It's bigger than an individual state government. The president is part of that government. Congress is part of that government. Is it, does it cover the entire country? Yes. It's called the national government or the federal government. Okay? So the president, make sure you have that. The president can pardon if it has to do with the federal government. Okay? but not if it has to do with just like an individual state or local thing. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, Anna, can a president um, pardon somebody when they haven't even been charged with a crime yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. What, if the person's already been charged with a crime, can the president pardon them? Okay, now, Anna, what if the person's been charged with a crime, found guilty, and they're sitting in prison? Can the president pardon them? And then what does that mean? Goes away. I mean, the charge goes away. The conviction goes away, they get to leave prison. Yeah. What's that? Why would a president do that? The president, this is an interesting thing, because the president has this like ability to go, I decide this is fair. The Constitution gave him that power. So Anna can the Congress go, no, we, we override your your pardon. Can the Congress override a president's pardon? Can the Supreme Court get rid of it? No, it can't be gotten rid of. Yeah. Nope. Nope, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, because I bought my printer, I bought my, bought my uh, ink and everything like that and so forth. I know. No, even less, even bigger no. Yeah, so yeah, sorry about that. Yes, I know. Well, um, work on that. Okay, so um, what if the president pardons more than one person? Write this down. You ready? It's called amnesty. Okay? A president is pardoning more than one person. It's called amnesty. So let me give you an example. Um, once upon a time during the Vietnam War, a whole bunch of people are like, this thing is crazy. We don't want to go to the war. We don't like the war, and so they resist it, okay? Or people would call them draft dodgers and so forth. Some of them went up to Canada. Others kind of laid low for a while. 
they were subject to arrest for a violation of federal law. When you are drafted, you're supposed to show up. And when you show up, whoop, careful, then they will train you. And a lot of these folks then were sent over to fight in the Vietnam War. Okay? Vietnam War was over. 1974, all wrapped up. But there were a whole bunch of people still facing federal criminal charges. Write this down. President number 39, Jimmy Carter, came in 1977. He looked and he said, well, you know, I think we need to clear this up. It was a time in our country's history where there was a lot of rancor and protest and, uh, and so forth. People were not really happy with the Vietnam War and other people are like, no, you need to do your duty. And he says, you know, I'm the president. I can give a pardon to everybody who dodged the draft. And he did. If it's a blanket pardon, it's called an amnesty. Got that? Pardon for many. Does that make sense? So he made that all go away. And if you were a man hanging out, a United States man hanging out in Canada, uh, for several years, having been in violation of the law in the United States, you could come back to the United States and hunky-dory not be charged with a crime. Does that make sense? Yeah. No? You can agree or disagree with it. The president has the power to do that. And so the president did that in that particular situation. Okay? We did this one, yes. Which one is more powerful? Actually, you weren't here, but you watched the video. Which one's more powerful? Oh, we make these videos so that if you're gone, you learn. Good thing we can. Yeah, you will watch it, Vera, because the tree and executive agreement, they're similar in that both of them are like on a piece of paper, an agreement between the United States and another country. Which of these two is more powerful? As in, it's going to last for a long, long time. Exactly, a treaty, okay? An executive agreement, the president makes the agreement with the leader of another country, and Trey, when can an executive agreement be gotten rid of? Yeah, exactly, when the term is over, I mean, probably the, the, the president themselves isn't going to get rid of it, but the next president might. Do you remember the example I gave? It's, that's, that's an example of that. You know, we agreed to go along with that. It was an international kind of agreement and so forth. The other example I gave, it happened also during President Obama's administration. It was a deal that he had made with? With an I? Oh, I, Exactly, I ran. Very good. And President Trump is like, mm, no, I'm not going to go along with that. Had President Obama sent that to the Senate to be ratified as a treaty? No. And Michael, what percentage of the Senate would be required for a treaty to be enacted? That is correct. Very good. And that's not an easy number to get to. So if the United States is going to make a binding agreement with another country, the only way it's going to happen is if it's sent to the United States Senate as a treaty and two-thirds agree to that. Okay? That's a big deal. You'll actually hear more about that because there was a treaty at the end of World War I. It was called the Versailles Peace Treaty. And yeah, President Wilson, number, uh, President number 28, brought that back, sent it over to the Senate. And they looked at it and they were like, uh, can we change it? And he's like, no. And he goes, well, if you can't change it because we don't like the way it's written, then forget about it. So it never became binding on our country. All right, next. Now, we get the appointment powers. Okay, this would be on page two, near the bottom, the second bullet point from the bottom in your handout. Okay, appointments. This is very important. Okay, in the federal government, the executive branch, we've got lots and lots and lots of people there, most of them working regular from president to president to president, you know, post office, military, you know, whatever. But the top layer, write this down. The president gets to pick the top layer, the bosses, okay? Some of them are going to be in the cabinet. 
Some of them are going to be in like sort of sub-cabinet level, like maybe not the top layer, but just the next layer. The president's not going to pick every postal official in the country. That actually happened like, you know, a long time ago. But nowadays, just the top, top ones. Okay, now make sure you put this down. Because some of those positions, the president just gets to pick and that's it. Let me give you a really good example. The people in the White House that work for the president, the top advisors actually in the White House, the president gets to pick those. Doesn't have to go through anything. The president just does it. He says, I want this person to be my press secretary. I want this person to be my economic advisor. I want this person to be my military advisor. It's there. But, write this down, some of them have to be approved by the United States Senate. You got that? Some of them, if they want to have that job, then it is only with the so-called advice and consent of the Senate. Now, to make it sort of easy, Anna, what do you suppose the percentage requirement is for the Senate to approve say somebody who the president chose for one of these positions. It's lower than two thirds. It's gonna be a simple majority, yeah, it's a simple majority. But you still have to be careful on that because like right now the United States, let me see, what is the um, division between Republicans and Democrats in the Senate? Oh, it's 50-50. There's one more Democrat in the sense that who breaks the tie? Kamala Harris, the Vice President, exactly. Um, Whenever you get a new president come in, a lot of times they'll be like, okay, like these cabinet secretaries that Trump had, the head of like the, the State Department and the Treasury Department and housing and urban development and so forth. For the most part, you're, the new president, especially if it's from a different party, they're going to go, oh, okay, you guys can go now. I'm going to bring my people in. Does that make sense? Make sure you have that. The president usually brings their people in. Every once in a while, in a rare case, a Republican will keep a Democrat or a Democrat will keep a Republican, but not always. Typically, they bring their own in. At the beginning of a president's term, which is where we're at right now with Biden, you're going to get a lot of those. In fact, that's what Biden's been pretty busy with over the last month or so, uh, pointing all these different people to different positions. There's one that's been in the news, and it's a little complicated because this person was on Twitter a lot. We're not talking about but this person was on Twitter a lot and criticizing these people and that people and sometimes Democrats and a lot of times Republicans. And some of them now are like, you know, there's no way I'm going to vote for you for approval in the Senate. So one of, uh, one of the appointments that Biden has made, it kind of looks like they're not going to get through. And when I read about it, they're just like, oh, for goodness sakes, they're not going to get through the Senate because there's at least one or two Democrats that are not going to go with them, and then the Republicans aren't going to go, and you're not going to get it. So just stick them in a job in the White House. How many senators do you need to approve just some job in the White House? Didn't I tell you? A lot of the White House jobs don't have to go through the Senate. No. You know, like when we had President Trump in there, he had all kinds of people come and go. He would appoint them. I mean, just hire them. It's just like hiring your staff. Certain people, you have to run by the Senate, the advice and consent, okay? And you need a simple majority there. Does that follow? Okay. And before they do that, they'll have a hearing. They'll bring the person in. They'll ask them some questions and so forth. And after that's all said, they'll have a vote. All right, now. Let's go through those three different examples. Um, let's do the third one first, because since we got the picture up here. Cabinet officers. The heads or secretaries um, is usually the title of the different executive departments. That's why I got a good picture right here. Um, probably in, in the near future, I don't know, with social distancing, I don't know when you're going to get as many people that close together in the White House um, under President Biden. But he will have a person for each of the jobs that, is cur that was held by that crew there. Does that make sense? The cabinet. Where did we run across the cabinet before? Ava, do you remember the 25th Amendment? The president goes, do 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 do, Coca-Cola Puffs. 
And everyone's like, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have that person as president. Could the vice president be acting president yes. under the 25th Amendment? If the vice president says yes and, remember the other part of it? A simple majority of the cabinet. That's the 25th Amendment. Have we ever used the 25th Amendment for that purpose that way? No, I don't think not yet. Okay? And hopefully we won't have to. Yeah, that would be really bad. Sometimes, I mean, it's like if a president has a stroke or something and they're clearly out of it, then it's not really controversial. The president is alive, but they're not capable of doing that job. So I think that wouldn't be very, very uh, problematic. But what if the president's just like really, really dangerously unbalanced? Uh, well, then we'll have to see. Okay? All right, next one. Let's do ambassadors. Okay? Raise your hand if you have an idea of what an ambassador is. Go for it. They are our person to the other country. How many countries do we have ambassadors? <laughs> I mean, like, pretty much all of them, almost all of them. And some of those positions are, like, regular, like, lifelong foreign service officers. They're professionals, and they're there all the time. Some of them, how many of you guys like to be an ambassador? Appointed by the president, approved by the Senate. And you go, I mean, it's like, look over here. How many of you guys like to be an ambassador, I don't know, to the Vatican or San Marino? Or where's the other one I'm looking? Oh, Monaco! You guys know about the Monaco? Princess uh, Grace Kelly was there and so forth. Yeah, it's a resort. It's on the French coast. It's really nice. You can put this down. Some people get appointed for ambassador positions who are big contributing donors to the president's winning election campaign. Now, they, don't, they shouldn't say or do anything stupid when they go over there, but those are not like really super critical relations with the United States. If you want to be the ambassador to say to China, you need to know what you're talking about, right? You need to be pretty cognizant, okay? Yeah. They are the official U.S. representative to another country. And where they will work is in that other country's capital city, and they will work in a place, raise your hand if you can tell me, what is the like, building complex that they're going to work? Yes, no? Embassy. Have you ever heard of an embassy? Yeah, so like when I take students abroad and so forth, if they lose their passport, <laughs> then you go to the embassy to get the passport replaced. Or if in like, you know, I think we had to do that when I was in Rome once. Uh, although they have, the United States also has consulate offices, so it's like an embassy in some of the other cities. Yeah. When you're planning on going to your like, next trip? I have no, I can't even leave the country right now. Next I don't know, it would be really fun. I, I don't know that that's in the cards now. The last one I was working on, we were just this close. I know your sister was going to be going on that one, and then it was like, we wouldn't have been able to do it anyway because of, uh, of COVID. So hopefully, and it looks like, uh, in fact, that was Israel. Um, Israel now has got so many people vaccinated, they're handing out, like, vaccine passport things and so forth because they want to make sure that people get on planes are going to be uh, cool and safe and everything. Okay? So ambassadors. Got that? United States ambassadors. Most of the ambassadors that we have to many of the countries in Africa, Asia, and South America and so forth, and Central America, don't really change over that much. But the big wig ones, like ambassador to like some wealthy country that you know seems like it would be a lot of fun, those ones switch out. Okay, not too controversial there. The next one, write this down: federal judges and Supreme Court justices. Those are controversial. Vera, which do you suppose is going to be the most controversial? Just a regular federal judge or one of the Supreme Court justice positions? Supreme Court, because they have the most power. They're the final word on interpreting what's in the Constitution. We're going to end up talking a lot about those guys. You're going to know them all by name and kind of like where they're coming from. And this is actually a bit of a surprise. Um, the president gets to appoint a federal judge or a Supreme Court justice at the very top of the federal United States judicial branch whenever there's a vacancy, and those are life appointments. 
They can stay on the job until they die. So when they die, then the president gets to appoint the replacement. There is another way, write this down. If there's like so much work in the federal judiciary, this has been the case over the last four years, there's so much work they created new positions, well, you need new judges in those new positions. And who gets to appoint those? The president. President Trump, make a note of this. This was, a, this was quite astounding. President Trump was able to pick three out of the nine justices on the Supreme Court. How did that happen? Two resigned. They'd been in there for a long time, and one did die. Okay, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died just this past year. And President Trump got to appoint that replacement. Put this down. This is an interesting thing, because it used to be that if you didn't like who the person was being appointed, you could filibuster. They got rid of that. For federal judges, when the Democrats were in charge of the, the Senate, they changed the rule. And then the Republicans, in the last three, four years, they changed the rule in the Supreme Court. So if it gets out of committee, it comes to the full Senate for a vote, how many votes do you need to get a federal judge or a Supreme Court justice approved by the Senate? How many do you need? How many votes? Three quarters? Two thirds? No, no votes? No, no, the president has all the power. This is, this is advice and consent of the Senate. What's the lowest minimum kind of requirement? A simple majority. So write that down. Simple majority. Just like with ambassadors, just like with um, cabinet officers. Okay? Will Biden get to appoint anybody to the Supreme Court? I don't know. If somebody res resigns uh, or dies while he is in office, then he would get to appoint that replacement. Or some people are talking about expanding the number of seats on the Supreme Court. I don't know that that's going to happen. I kind of doubt it. That hasn't happened in like well over 100 years. We've been stuck at nine for a long, long time, and I have a feeling it's going to kind of stay that way. Okay? So this is a very important uh, uh, thing that the president can do. Now, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. There is a little thing called recess appointments. It's the last bullet point at the bottom of page two. Filling temporary vacancies during a Senate recess. Um, President Obama, when he was in there, he was a little frustrated because he would want to appoint somebody to some position, some executive position, maybe sub-cabinet level or ambassador position. And he was a little frustrated because um, the Republicans at the time were in the majority in the Senate. And they're like, we don't like your appointment. So we're not going to say yeah. And Obama's like, oh my gosh. I'm the president. I get to pick, right? Just like you said, the president gets to pick them, right? So does the president get the final word? Who gets the final word? The Senate. So here's what President Obama started doing. You ready? Recess appointments. It's in the Constitution that if the Senate is in recess, they are not sitting, they're not having their session, They've gone on like, I don't know, maybe a month long summer recess because it's really hot in Washington, D.C. If that's the case, then the president can make an appointment and it's temporary until the president's out of office. Well, I mean, you know, for ambassador positions and cabinet positions, I mean, they're already kind of temporary that way anyway. They're going to they're gonna be like done when the next president comes in. The Republicans didn't like that. In the Senate, they're like, oh, we don't like that. So you know what they did? They never went on recess. No, they hasn't, seriously, what they did. In the summertime, they would show up, like maybe one or two of them, senators. They'd start the session that day and then quit for the day. So they were still in session. They just ended it quickly that day. Came back the next day, did the same thing. So the president's like, they look like they're in recess. I'm going to go ahead and appoint somebody. And the Republicans are like, we're not in recess in the Senate. And if we're not in recess, then you can't appoint somebody. They fought it all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, who determines whether or not the Senate is in recess? The president or the Senate? Exactly the Senate. So the Republicans won in that particular situation. Okay? 
So it's kind of weird. It's just a little gamesy kind of thing that happens in politics sometimes when you can't get agreement. Usually, though, put this down. President Biden, he's going to pick people that he wants for ambassadors, for the cabinet, and most of the time, unless they've got something like really seriously wrong, all the Democrats are going to go for it, and a lot of the Republicans are going to as well. I mean, that's the way things have been for many, many years. Not as much now, but for the most part, it's kind of like, look, you want these guys to work for you? We know who the real boss is. If these guys messed up during President Trump's time, who's probably going to get most of the blame? The one who appointed them. Okay? So that's where it comes. So it's kind of like, well, if you want to put somebody in there that's prone to making mistakes and messing up, well, it's going to be on your head. Does that make sense? Okay? So, not too much controversy there. All right. Now, let's go to top of page three. Article two, section three. Some additional powers of the President of the United States. The annual State of the Union Address, write this down. Every year, according to the Constitution, the President is supposed to present to Congress, they usually meet in the House of Representatives chamber because there's more seats, they bring the senators in, they bring in a lot of the representatives, they fill the gallery, they get the television cameras, they have a speech. And it's actually coming up pretty soon because I've been seeing this in the news. This will be President Biden's first State of the Union speech. Now, the Constitution doesn't say it has to be a speech. In fact, all the way up until President number 28, Woodrow Wilson, they would just write it out and send it over to the Congress and go, hey, this is how the country's doing. The country's doing this and, and economics and, and, and foreign policy and we're at war and da, da 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 Oh, and by the way, here's some proposals that I have. So pay attention, Congress. But ever since President Wilson, Every single president, every year, does that address what's in writing face to face. They go to Congress and they give the speech on television. It's the one speech that typically, if you're, if you're going to watch one speech by the president, that would be it. Over the shoulder of the president is the president of the Senate. So that would be what position? Uh, Vice president. Very good. And this was during uh, Trump's first two years. This is Paul Ryan. He's a Republican from Wisconsin, and his position was? Of the House. Very good. So who would have been over Trump's shoulder in the last two years? Exactly, Nancy Pelosi. Who's going to be over Biden's shoulder on this side when he gives the speech? Kamala Harris, Vice President, President of the Senate. And who will be over here? Exactly, Nancy Pelosi, all right? And so then they'll give the speech, and he'll be talking about all the various different things. Do you think President Biden's going to talk about COVID? No. Yeah. Do you think he'll talk about, like, immigration? No. Yeah. Economic stimulus and so forth? No. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see kind of what other types of things. You can write this down. It usually lasts about an hour. Um, <laughs> under normal circumstances, it's a crowded room. I think it's going to be a little bit different this time, okay? I think it'll be quite a bit different. And the head of the Capitol Police, I think it was the head of the Capitol Police, was saying, oh, we need to be on alert because somebody might try and do something really stupid and attack President Biden when he's giving the State of the Union speech. I'm like, here we go again. I have a feeling that if they didn't have enough security there already, they're going to have additional security on that location on that day. Yeah, exactly. I think hopefully people can. Okay? Does that make sense? Questions about the State of the Union Address? All right. The President also, next bullet point, recommends measures. The President may recommend measures, which basically means I've got some ideas for some bills. Does the President have a good chance of getting bills through Congress? Depends, doesn't it? If the President has his or her political party in the majority in the House, that really helps, and in the Senate. Although sometimes you just need to compromise. Oh my gosh. Who voted for like COVID relief bills that were signed ultimately by President Trump? Did Republicans, Democrats? 
the earlier ones both were actually voting for those. Those were, had a lot of support. I think the one, the most recent one, went through the House with all, all but two Democrats voting in favor of it and all the Republicans voted against it. And now it's in the Senate. And as long as the, there's some weird rules and so forth, because you're thinking, oh, well, that'll get filibustered. It'll get defeated. Well, it's just sort of like a, what they call a reconciliation of what is going on already. Like, huh? Yeah. So all they need is a simple majority plus the vice president to go along with it. And then what do they do after they get the bill? They have a special signing ceremony at the White House. Isn't it really cool to be there? Does that kid look impressed to be there at the signing ceremony? I, know, I was like, I love this. I, I saw this picture. I'm like, oh, i got to keep that picture in there. It's probably the kid of one of the members of Congress and one of the people that has something to do with this bill. There's the Donald Trump one. Apparently, he liked to use like the big, like, um, oh, gosh, uh, Sharpie points. Yeah, because he's like big punts. So he's got a, a signature that goes lots of ups and downs and so forth. Sometimes, like I remember President Johnson, number 36, when he was signing like the voting rights bill or the civil rights bill, he would take a pen and he would put his, uh, he would start the signature or sort of just tap it and then they'd hand him out as like uh, souvenirs to the top members of Congress who helped participate in getting that bill passed. How would you arrange that Biden only last four years? What? I don't have to worry about, to be honest. <laughs> what I'm worried about to be right now is I hope Biden stays in good health. I mean, that's just what I wish on everybody. But, I mean, it could happen if, you know, I would hate to see, like, a he William Henry Harrison situation with no, this I guy. Mean, like, if he gets, like, if in the next election he gets, like, booted out. Well, if you didn't notice before, right underneath this one was a Donald Trump one, and it said 2017 dash Question mark. So this is a new one that we printed off to put a bookend on his presidency. What will be the bookend on Joe Biden's? Uh, five. five, perhaps, if it's one term, or? Uh, or 29. Oh, my God. It's a long time from now. But like if yeah. does, I think it's going to be moot, <laughs> honestly. I, I, like I said, I think it's going to be moot. Thank you for like thinking I'm at the beginning of my career, but mm, I think it's going to be moot. Okay. Yeah. My big concern is yeah. Now that I went to all the trouble to rearrange it so that people's like <sighs> asymmetric like sensibilities aren't going to be all thrown out or like you know like people with my tie because that would really bug you if I like had my tie that way, wouldn't it? Very be like, can you fix that? Can you fix that? Can you fix that? So, was this okay with you guys now? Yeah. yeah, I think so. But yeah, no, I mean, it's, a, it's an issue. Because, I mean, how many presidents are going to be around in your lifetime? Like, 10? No, like, yeah, like 10. Do you know how many have been around in my lifetime? Uh, all 46. <laughs> You're a horrible child. <laughs> Do you know, anybody know who the president was when I was born? It was at the tail end of his presidency. Uh, uh, Although he was supposed to have served, yeah, it was Kennedy, uh, yeah. I was born in 1963, and he was shot in November of that 11? year. Yeah, mm -hmm. like maybe 10 yeah. yeah, no, that's probably fairly reasonable. Or no, I, I mean, at, at this point in your life, hopefully you'll continue on much further. No, yeah, my dad was born during the presidency of Calvin Coolidge. And he died just in the early stages of Trump's presidency. So that's like almost you know, one and a half rows there. Okay? All right, so the president uh, recommends bills to Congress. And then, of course, he's going to uh, be able to say, look, this is an opportunity for you to get this bill done the way I want you to, yada, yada, yada. And I'll sign it if you pass it in a way that I like. Make sense? If you pass it in a way that he doesn't like, he could veto it. Okay? All right, let's go to the next one. Receiving ambassadors or not. Let me explain this. The president has the sole authority to say to an ambassador from another country, 
I welcome you, or I don't welcome you. It's smudged. And you're like, what do you mean, I welcome you or I don't welcome you? That's weird. I mean, is it like, wow, you get snubbed at the airport? I mean, you're still the ambassador, right? No, write this down. The president basically gets to say, we're going to have relations with you officially as country to country or not. I'll give you examples. In 1917, the communists took over the Soviet Union, took over Russia. The United States was not very happy about that. The Soviet Union were like sending out ambassadors to various different parts of the world. The United States is like, don't even bother coming over here. Write this down. When we do not receive their ambassador, it's like us saying, we don't recognize your government. We know that you've got a country over there, but we don't recognize your government. We think it might go away. And we actually did try to get rid of the communists in the Soviet Union in the early stages. Didn't work out. Eventually, we're like, oh, okay, well, you're there. It wasn't until like within like a decade and a half, President Roosevelt said, all right, fine, we'll receive your ambassador. And then we also sent an ambassador to the Soviet Union. Got that? When the communists took over China in 1949, we were like, oh, no, 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 we weren't happy about that. 1949, I don't think we accepted a Chinese communist ambassador until the latter part of the 1970s. It took some doing, and then we sent ours over as well. Vietnam, we weren't too happy about recognizing the communist government of Vietnam. Hang on just a sec. But during the presidency of Bill Clinton, we did finally recognize the communist government of Vietnam, and we exchanged ambassadors. But what about Cuba? Take your question, and then we'll go to the Cuba situation. Um, so it's like you support and are like allies with a big country and like whatnot, but you just don't like the ambassadors. Then you would probably explain that to the country and say, hey, we've got a very important relationship here, and the person you're sending over is a real jerk. But you probably wouldn't do that like publicly. You would do it through like diplomatic channels to just sort of say, yeah, maybe you should send somebody over better. Or it happens the other way, too. Sometimes you get somebody like, well, I gave a bunch of money to so-and-so, they got elected president, and now I'm going to go over there and be an ambassador and party. Well, it depends on how you party. Because if you party too much and you act like a fool, then you're an embarrassment to this country, and that country is not happy to have you as a U.S. ambassador to that country. It's a good question, though. Because you want, let me see, ambassadors need to behave diplomatically. Do you know people who behave diplomatically? Do they tell you exactly what they think about you to your face? Oh, yep. No. <laughs> no. They try to keep things calm. Okay? Cuba. Cuba went communist in the late 50s. And there were a lot of Cubans uh, who did not like Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro was the long-standing communist leader of Cuba. And some of those, com some of those Cubans fled Cuba. Many of them went to live in Florida. Right? The United States was not happy with Cuba, tried to overthrow the communist government, didn't work out, but we never recognized their government. I mean, even after we recognized the communist government of Vietnam and the communist government of China and the communist government of the Soviet Union, we're like, we're not going to do it with Cuba. Write this down. Cuba took an extra long, long time. And one example of why it took an extra long, long time is a president doesn't necessarily want to do something that's going to hurt him politically. You're like, why did I put these pictures in here and so forth? During the time of President Clinton, there was a very sad story. There was a woman and some others who were trying to escape Cuba on boats, flimsy boats. Some of the boats sunk on the way between Cuba and Florida. It's a short distance, but I wouldn't swim it if I were you. And you have to be careful if you're in a boat. Um, Ilian Gonzalez was a little boy. His mother drowned, and some of the other people drowned. He made it ashore into Florida, and he had some uncles and aunts and other family members who took him in, and then, of course, he's welcome in the United States. Cuban refugees from the communist government were welcome in the United States. Well, it turns out that Ilian Gonzalez 
has a father in Cuba. The father and the mother were divorced. The mother took Elian Gonzalez to go over to the United States of America. She didn't make it. Elian Gonzalez did. The father went to the Cuban government and said, I'd like my son back. This little boy right here. I'd like my son back. And so in the midst of this whole thing, you had a child custody dispute. The uncles and aunts in the United States and Florida were like, he's going to stay with us. It's America. It's free. The father over in Cuba is like, he's my son. I want to have him back in Cuba. What would you do? You're the president of the United States of America. Are you going to send Elian Gonzalez back to Cuba? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Shh, hang a sec. Do you want to send him back to communist country? But it's his dad. His dad wanted him back. He's a little boy. What would you do? You think he'd send him back? Because that's always like his only surviving parent. What would you do? Send him back or keep him in America with the uncle and aunt? Well, they did have court hearings and so forth, but I mean, the president ultimately had a lot of control over this. Um, Tough one, huh? Really? Oh, who loves it more? What would you do? Aunt and uncle, aunt and uncle in America or dad back in Cuba? You'd want to look at more details and so forth? What would you do? What's that? The dad. Most court cases will say preference would go to a natural parent. President Clinton made the decision and this was in his second term. He wasn't running for president again. And one of the things, <laughs> you know, he never had to pay any political thing because in Cuba, there's a lot of Cuban Americans. And what are the typical Cuban American attitude toward Fidel Castro and the communist government? Like him or hate him? Hate him, exactly, because most of them are refugees from having fled communist Cuba. This picture shows a United States Marshal coming into the home uh, where. Ilian Gonzalez was being kept by an uncle in the closet. And they got Ilian Gonzalez. They took him. They took him back to Cuba. Yes, I was right. Well, that's what the president decided to do. And, and trust me, Castro's like, we're going to make sure this kid gets a really super de duper upbringing in Cuba. So he was given lots of love and attention, obviously, from the dad. But the Cuban government makes sure that, like, this kid is going to grow up and he's going to, like, have. Uh, no disadvantages. But I tell you what, the Cuban American population was not too happy. The next presidential election, Clinton wasn't on the ballot, but his vice president, Gore, was. How did Gore do in 2000, and 2000 Florida presidential election? He lost, and he would be defeated as President George W. Bush would be elected. Put this down. Obama eventually, because let me see, we go from Khalil Clinton to George W. Bush. I mean, this goes all the way back to Dwight D. Eisenhower. But President Obama was the first one to recognize the communist government of Cuba and exchange ambassadors with it. Okay? Actually, we've got those. Faithfully execute the laws, make government regulations. Uh, for the president, we kind of did executive orders there. We did Section 4, Grounds for Impeachment. Next time, we'll talk about Article 3, the Supreme Court, court and the federal courts. Okay? All right, that's good. Good, 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 good.